To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 12, Part 2 He opened it and said, We'll sing number 273. How are we going to sing it if there ain't any hymn books? Calpurnia smiled. Hush, baby, she whispered. You'll see in a minute. Zebo cleared his throat <clears throat> and read in a voice like the rumble of distant artillery. There's a land beyond the river. Miraculously on pitch, a hundred voices sang out Zebo's words. The last syllable held to a husky hymn was followed by Zebo saying, That we call the sweet forever. The music again swelled around us. The last note lingered, and Zebo met it with the next line. And we only reached that shore by face decree. The congregation hesitated. Zebo repeated the line carefully, and it was sung. At the chorus, Zebo closed the book, a signal for the congregation to proceed without his help. On the dying notes of Jubilee, Zebo said, in that far-off sweet forever, just beyond the shining river. Line for line, the voices followed in simple harmony until the hymn ended in a melancholy murmur. I looked at Jim, who was looking at Zebo from the corners of his eyes. I didn't believe it either, but we had both heard it. Reverend Sykes then called on the Lord to bless the sick and suffering a procedure no different from our church practice, except Reverend Sykes directed the deity's attention to several specific cases. His sermon was a forthright denunciation of sin, an austere declaration of the motto on the wall behind him. He warned his flock against the evils of heady brews, gambling, and strange women. Bootleggers caused enough trouble in the quarters, but women were worse. Again, as I had often met it in my own church, I was confronted with the impurity of women doctrine that seemed to preoccupy all clergymen. Jim and I had heard the same sermon Sunday after sermon, with only one exception. Reverend Sykes used his pulpit more freely to express his views on individual lapse from grace. Jim Hardy had been absent from church for five Sundays, and he wasn't sick. Constance Jackson had better watch her ways. She was in grave danger for quarreling with her neighbors. She had erected the only spike fence in the history of the quarters. Reverend Sykes closed his sermon. He stood beside a table in the front of the pulpit and requested the morning offering, a procedure that was strange to Jim and me. One by one, the congregation came forward and dropped nickels and dimes into the black enameled coffee can. Jim and I followed suit and received a soft, thank you, thank you, as our dimes clinked. To our amazement, Reverend Sykes emptied the can onto the table and raked the coins into his hand. He straightened up and said, this is not enough. We must have ten dollars. The congregation stirred. You all know what it's for. Helen can't leave those children to work while Tom's in jail. If everybody gives one more dime, we'll have it. Reverend Sykes waved his hand and called to someone in the back of the church. Alec, shut the doors. No one leaves here till we have ten dollars. Calpurnia scratched in her handbag and brought forth a battered leather coin purse. Now, Cal, whispered Jim, when she handed him a shiny quarter, we can put ours in. Give me your dime, Scout. The church was becoming stuffy, and it occurred to me that Reverend Sykes intended to sweat the amount due out of his flock. Fans crackled, feet shuffled, tobacco chewers were in agony. Reverend Sykes startled me by saying sternly, Carlo Richardson, I haven't seen you up this aisle yet. A thin man in khaki pants came up the aisle and deposited a coin. The congregation murmured approval. Reverend Sykes then said, I want all of you with no children to make a sacrifice and give one more dime apiece. Then we'll have it. Slowly, painfully, the ten dollars was collected. The door was opened, and the gust of warm air revived us. 
Zebo lined on Jordan's stormy banks, and the church was over. I wanted to stay and explore, but Calpurnia propelled me up the aisle ahead of her. At the church door, while she paused to talk with Zebo and his family, Jim and I chatted with Reverend Sykes. I was bursting with questions, but decided I would wait and let Calpurnia answer them. We were especially glad to have you all here, said Reverend Sykes. The church has no better friend than your daddy. My curiosity burst. Why were you all taking up collection for Tom Robinson's wife? Didn't you hear why? asked Reverend Sykes. Helen's got three little ones, and she can't go out to work. Why can't she take them with her, Reverend? I asked. It was customary for field Negroes with tiny children to deposit them in whatever shade there was while their parents worked. Usually the baby sat in the shade between two rows of cotton. Those unable to sit were strapped papoose-style on their mother's backs or resided in extra cotton bags. Reverend Sykes hesitated. To tell you the truth, Miss Jean Louise, Helen's finding it hard to get work these days. When it's picking time, I think Mr. Link Deals will take her. Why not, Reverend? Before he could answer, I felt Calpurnia's hand on my shoulder. At its presence, I said, I thank you for letting us come. Jim echoed me, and we made our way homeward. Cal, I know Tom Robinson's in jail, and he's done something awful, but why won't folks hire Helen, I asked. Calpurnia, in her navy vole dress and tub of hat, walked between Jim and me. It's because of what folks say Tom's done, she said. Folks aren't anxious to, to have anything to do with any of his family. Just what did he do, Cal? Calpurnia sighed. Old Mr. Bob Ewell accused him of raping his girl and had him arrested and put in jail. Mr. Ewell? My memory stirred. Does he have anything to do with those Ewells that come every first day of school and then go home? Why, Atticus said they were absolute trash. I never heard Atticus talk about folks the way he talked about the Ewells. He said, yes, those are the ones. Well, if everybody in Maycomb knows what kind of folks the Ewells are, they'd be glad to hire Helen. What's rape, Cal? It's something you'll have to ask Mr. Finch about, she said. He can explain it better than I can. You all hungry? The Reverend took a long time unwinding this morning. He's not usually so tedious. He's just like our preacher, said Jim. But why do you all sing hymns that way? Lining, she asked. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's called Linen. They've done it that way as long as I can remember. Jim said it looked like they could save the collection money for a year and get some hymn books. Calpurnia laughed. Wouldn't do any good, she said. They can't read. Can't read, I asked. All those folks? That's right, Calpurnia nodded. Can't but about four folks at first purchase read. I'm one of them. Where'd you go to school, Cal? asked Jim. Nowhere. Let's see now, who taught me my letters? It was Miss Maudie Atkinson's aunt, old Miss Buford. Are you that old? I'm older than Mr. Finch, even, Calpurnia grinned. Not sure how much, though. We started remembering one time, trying to figure out how old I was. I can remember back just a few years more than he can. So I'm not much older when you take off the fact that men can't remember as well as women. What's your birthday, Cal? I just have it on Christmas. It's easier to remember that way. I don't have a real birthday. But Cal, Jim protested, you don't look even near as old as Atticus. Colored folks don't show their age so fast, she said. Maybe because they can't read. Cal, did you teach Zebo? Yes, Mr. Jim. There wasn't a school even when he was a boy. I made him learn, though. Zebo was Calpurnia's eldest son. If I had ever thought about it, I would have known that Calpurnia was a, of mature years. Zebo had half-grown children, but then I'd never thought about it. Did you teach out of a primer like us? I asked. No, I made him get a page out of the Bible every day. 
and there was a book Miss Buford taught me out of. Bet you don't know where I got it, she said. We didn't know. Calpurnia said, Your granddaddy Fitch gave it to me. Were you from the landing? Jim asked. You never told us that. I certainly am, Mr. Jim. Grew up down there between the Buford place and the landing. I've spent all my days working for the Finches or the Bufords, and I moved to make them when your daddy and your mama married. What was the book, Cal? I asked. Blackstone's Commentaries. Jim was thunderstruck. You mean you taught Zebo out of that? Why, yes, sir, Mr. Jim. Calpurnia timidly put her fingers to her mouth. They were the only books I had. Your granddaddy said Mr. Blackstone wrote fine English. That's why you don't talk like the rest of them, said Jim. The rest of who? The rest of the colored folks. Cal, but you talk like they did in church. That Calpurnia led a modest double life never dawned on me. The idea that she had a separate existence outside our household was a novel one, to say nothing of her having command of two languages. Cal, I asked, why do you talk to the to your folks when you know it's not right? Well, in the first place, I'm black. That doesn't mean you have to talk that way when you know better, said Jim. Calpurnia tilted her hat and scratched her head, then pressed her hat down carefully over her ears. It's right hard to say, she said. Suppose you and Scout talked colored folks talk at home. It'd be out of place, wouldn't it? Now what if I talked white folks talk at church with my neighbors? They'd think I was putting on airs to beat Moses. But Cal, you know better, I said. It's not necessary to tell all you know. It's not ladylike. In the second place, folks don't like to have somebody around knowing more than they do. It aggravates them. You're not going to change any of them by talking right. They've got to want to learn themselves. And when they don't want to learn, there's nothing you can do but keep your mouth shut or talk their language. Cal, can I come see you sometimes? She looked down at me. See me, honey. You see me every day. Out to your house, I said. Sometimes after work, Atticus can get me. Any time you want to, she said. We'd be glad to have you. We were on the sidewalk by the Radley place. Look on the porch yonder, Jim said. I looked over at the Radley place, expecting to see its phantom occupant sunning himself in the swing. The swing was empty. I mean our porch, said Jim. I looked down the street. Enamored, upright, uncompromising, Aunt Alexandra was sitting in a rocking chair, exactly as if she had sat there every day of her life. And we'll go on with chapter 13 in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.